Thank you so much. I've often thought of myself as more of a Jed Clampett <laughs> rather than a Jedi Knight. Hey, it's so good to be with you. You know, your, your, your worship team uh, so powerful tonight. I just felt the anointing of God from the time I walked in and, and just heard. Lord, it's so, good. it's so good to see great musicians with greater hearts. And so I just uh, tip my hat to the worship team tonight. Thank you. Amen. Well, have you been handling this pandemic stuff okay? Are you getting sick of it like I am? I'm so tired of these masks. I just can't hardly stand it. Um, you know, in Christmas time, we were, uh, you know, they keep opening up restaurants and closing restaurants and opening this and opening that, and you couldn't see people. I couldn't see my little 85-year-old mom and stuff like that, and it was just a, it was just a bummer. And then uh, I could only have uh, uh, my two daughters and their families with us at, at Christmas time. I couldn't get the whole family, and, and we were just trying to make the most of it, watching the Christmas movies and doing all that stuff, and, you know, and trying to put on a happy face, you know, like you do in church sometimes. And, uh, and then uh, the most wonderful thing happened. My, uh, my little four-year-old grandson, he had his mom pack all of his superhero stuff. So every day he would come down and he would, one day he'd be Spider-Man. The next day he'd be the Iron Man. Then his favorite, I'm Captain America, America. And it just like he was, he was just encouraging us and, and he, he nearly died when he was born and, and, and we were so thankful that he's with us. His name is Kaz uh, and he uh, is just a joy bringer. And every day that he was with us, it just seemed like he was carrying this joy that was just invading us. And before we knew it, our spirits were light. We were in joy. We were laughing, rolling around on the floor, having all kinds of fun together. Went out and got a Christmas tree together like we usually do. And we just, in the middle of all this depression and despair, we found some joy. And it came in a little four-year-old boy. And... Uh, and I want to talk to you tonight about something the Lord spoke to me at, during that time. And I got to thinking about, well, who was my uh, superhero when I was little? Who was that for me? Well, it was Superman. When I was little, Superman was it. I mean, he was special. He had superpowers. He could fly. Show a picture of Superman. Look at the graphics. Doesn't that just get you? <laughs> Man, I'd see Superman on Saturday morning. I'd tie a towel around my neck, and I, would, I was Superman. Nothing could mess with me. And he could, he could leap over tall buildings in a single bound. He was faster than a speeding bullet. He could see through stuff. It was amazing. But he had one weakness, and that weakness was kryptonite. Kryptonite was a compound from his home planet. And, and whenever he got near it, he would start to lose his strength. If he, stayed, if he stayed near it too long, he would even die. So when his enemies started learning about kryptonite, they were always trying to figure out how to get some kryptonite and get it next to Superman. And I'm thinking about that, and I'm full of joy for my grandson, Kaz. As I'm going to bed that night, I just said, Lord, so cool to have Kaz bring in that joy. And the Lord just whispered in my ears something that really touched me. He said, you want me to tell you your superpower? And I said, absolutely. He said, the believer's superpower is joy. The believer's superpower is joy. And I just stuck in my heart, and I remembered immediately in, in Nehemiah 8.10, it says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. It's my power. That word there in the Hebrew means to make glad, to rejoice, to be, have constant gladness, creating an atmosphere of faith. Joy is our, it lifts our mood, it strengthens our faith, and it builds people up around us. And I saw many, many people losing their joy during all this mess that we've been through. And I realized God was revealing something to me that I should have known. We all should have known. But Peter says, I don't hesitate to remind you of things you should know. So God was reminding me that the joy of the Lord is my strength. And then I started realizing, I wonder if this pandemic ball of stress and worry 
and discouragement and despair and losing your job and all that kind of stuff and all of the vitriol going on on social media. I wonder if that is like our kryptonite. If the compound of all that is, is actually acting as kryptonite on the people of God and we're losing our strength. Statistics tell us that half the people that used to be in our church will never come back. I don't believe in statistics. I believe in Jesus. And he'll do what he wants to do. But it, it is a fact that many people have lost strength. They've lost their zeal for sure. You know, everyone's trying to figure it out. I'm going to be a little bit crude here. Sorry for those online that are a lot purer than I am. But there's an old saying we say down south. It's hard to remember your job is to drain the swamp when you're up to your butt in alligators. <laughs> And I think that's how we all feel. I think that's how we all feel. How do I remember how to do this and to have a good attitude when I, when I feel like I'm up to, to there in alligators? How can I stay focused on what I should be doing? Churches, schools, businesses, students, parents are facing the stress of coping with a very uncertain future. Joy, that fruit of the Spirit we need most, seems to have been misplaced when COVID-19 showed up. Well, where do you find joy when it goes missing. Well, one of my superheroes in the Bible is King David. He's always a go-to, and I really need to understand some things about the Lord. It seems like I find a lot of it around David. King David knew from Psalm 1611, in your presence is fullness of joy. I walked in tonight, and I started worshiping with you guys, and, and I just felt joy just racing through me. I was in his presence, and there was fullness of joy there. David learned that when thieves tried to rob him of his joy in 1 Samuel 30. Why don't you turn there to 1 Samuel 30, and I'll get there in just a few minutes. Let me set it up for you. David had been away on a military mission, and they'd had a bunch of victories, but he and his army of 600 were going home. And I think if they're like most men, they couldn't, couldn't wait to get home and see their families, their wives, and their kids, and know the joy of being with your family. And they were on their way home, 1 Samuel 30. Well, to me, King David was a superhero, but he was a very flawed man who made huge mistakes. But through it all, through everything he did right and everything he did wrong, he was a man after God's own heart. He was a worshiper. He was a prophet. He was a warrior. He was a musician. He was a king, a songwriter. He's my kind of guy. He kept a tender heart toward God. Now, David had more than his share of stress. Let me just give you some of his story, just remind you. After he slayed Goliath as a young boy, he was like a superhero in Israel. They were singing songs about him. Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his ten thousands. They were singing about him. He was a superhero. But he had more than his share of stress. He barely escaped several assassination attempts by King Saul, the guy he was trying to serve. So he spent time in the wilderness, hiding in, in caves with people surrounding him who were described as being in debt, discontent, and distressed. You ever been around people like that? <laughs> you ever been to people like that? <laughs> you're just in debt. You're distressed and you're discouraged. You're discontent. David suffered the shame of having committed adultery and murder and having to live with that. And his family was a hot mess. His son Amnon raped his daughter Tamar. His other son Absalom murdered Amnon. Then Absalom led a revolt against his dad, resulting in Absalom being killed, piling more grief onto David. It was like a terrible reality show. It helped me to see how David dealt with difficult people, stressful situations, and his own weaknesses. I don't know if you've had to deal with those things during this pandemic, but I have. I've, sometimes my weaknesses gets highlighted to me, and it, it doesn't. It doesn't cause me to run away. It drives me to my knees. When I discover what God's doing, it usually makes me stronger. 
Isn't that what most of us face? Difficult people, stressful situations, and our own weaknesses. Well, how did David handle times of trouble? When he was surrounded by enemies, how did he handle it? Well, let's read 1 Samuel 30, verse 1 through 10. David and his men reached Ziglag, that's where he had been living, on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and the Ziglag, and they had attacked Ziglag, and they burned it. They took captive of the women and all who were in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but they carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men came to Ziglag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Just think about that for a minute. Think about it. You've been out fighting the good fight. You come home and all that's precious, all that brings joy in your life is taken away and you've been robbed. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. They were exhausted. And now they were cut to the bone. David's two wives had been captured, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. They were blaming him. (laughs) That's kind of the role of the senior pastor sometimes. Uh, You get a lot of the blame. That's why you get the big bucks, though. That's, That's what that's about. Because they were bitter in spirit because of their sons and daughters. But David, look at this. But David found strength or power or might in the Lord his God. How did he do that? What did he do? Then David said to Abiathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. And that was a a garment that they wore when they were going to really seriously get to seeking the Lord. Bring me the ephod. Abiathar brought it to him, and David inquired the Lord. That means he pressed in. He sought the Lord with all of his heart. And he asked the Lord this, Shall I pursue this raiding party, and will I overtake them? Who would do that? If someone stole my wife and my kids, I would get on my bike, and I would go after them without that thought. I own guns. I would take those with me. You're not going to mess with my family. But David didn't do that. He asked the Lord, should I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Then he got what was waiting for, hearing from God. Pursue them, God answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. So David and his 600 men with him came to Besor Ravine, where some stayed behind for 200 men were too exhausted to even cross the ravine to get their own families. But David and 400 men continued the pursuit. Okay, I'll come back to that. I just want to consider a few things that David did. Number one, he kept doing his job. He was a man after God's own heart. No matter what, he was going to seek God's heart first about whatever he did. His job was leading an army of ordinary people to face whatever adversity came in the strength of the Lord. And he was able to do it only by staying wholly dependent on God from whom his strength came from. He kept doing that thing that he had always done, keeping his heart hard after God. Next thing he did is he he went to God first. Not in desperation as he's riding after his enemies, he went to God first. When the enemy attacked and kidnapped his family and the families of his men, his response was not fast enough for the men, and they got angry at him. They were so angry and bitter of spirit, they were talking about killing him. What do you mean you're seeking God? we got to go after our family, you idiot. We're serving an idiot. Rather than jump on his horse and go after his family, the first thing David did was to encourage and strengthen himself in the Lord. And although everyone around him was angry at his slow response, David asked and waited on God to speak to him and to restore his strength. When David heard God and obeyed, it goes on to say he recovered everything. It's interesting, while he was waiting on the Lord, the enemy were getting drunk as skunks on the other side of the ravine. I mean, they were getting knee-wobbly drunk. They were getting commode hugging drunk. That's how drunk they were. They couldn't even hardly walk and get around. So by the time David came over, 
they just waltzed in and just took all their stuff back and laughed at them as they were doing it and went back home. God's often doing more behind our back than we can see in front of our faces. And sometimes it's while we're waiting, while we're inquiring of him, he's doing so much he could not do if we were in the way. Waiting's not a bad thing. Waiting is a good thing. The other thing he did is he stayed committed to his friends and his community. When they went over, the 600, 200 of them were too tired and exhausted, so they stayed with the supplies. 400 went over. Now look at what it says in verse 21 through 25. Look over there. Then David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted. When they were coming back with all of their stuff, they get back to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow him and who were left behind at the Besser Ravine. They came out to meet David and the people with him. And as David and his men approached, he greeted them. But look at this. There's always some people like this around you. But all the evil men and the troublemakers among David's followers said, because they did not go out with us, we will not share with them in the plunder we recovered. However, each man can take his wife and children and go. They, they didn't fight with us. They don't deserve any of the stuff that we got. But look at David's heart. David replied, no, my brothers, you must not do that with what the Lord has given us. He has protected us and handed us over to us the forces that came against us. Who will listen to what you say? The share of the man who stayed with the supplies is to be the same as that of him who went down to the battle. All will share alike. David made this a statute and ordinance for Israel from that day until this. David remained loyal to his friends and his community. He was a man of covenant. They were a people of covenant. They didn't forget each other. They were like the Marines. They didn't leave any man behind. That should have been their attitude, but it wasn't for some of the troublemakers. It's tempting to forsake the assembling of ourselves together in community when the going gets tough. Well, where's so-and-so? How come they're not helping us? Are they just staying at home? It's, it's crazy what this pandemic has brought out in people. People have actually been mean to each other. Some people are just exhausted and fearful and sitting at home, afraid to get out. Afraid to stay in, just trapped. So we think they're just weak Christians. Let's just get on with our life and forget them. No, we're in this together. We're people of covenant. We're people of covenant. We don't leave anybody behind. Well, how did David get his superpower back? How did he recover his joy? I've already told you, but let me just mention, he inquired of God. That meant he worshiped. He poured out his heart in songs of praise, lament, and joy. He was transparent before God. Psalm 89, 15 says, Blessed are those who know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of your presence. If you don't have joy, run to where it is. It's in God's presence. Go find it. Go get you some. Let it fill you up. Light exposes darkness and it dismisses fear. There's light in his presence. There's joy in his presence. David placed his trust in God to help him. He sang songs and, he, and psalms he had written to strengthen himself. By, he determined to keep praising God no matter what. Keep inquiring of God no matter what. He overcame anxiety by seeking the Lord through praise, prayer, and meditating on the Lord. That was David's life pattern. I'm kind of like David. I get in trouble all the time. And it's always bigger than I can handle. And my only option is to go to God and to find strength in him and to let him be my champion. In these Psalms, David was saying the same thing over and over. In times of trouble, put your trust in the Lord and joy will return. Stay close to him through praising God and praying to him, asking him for help. And we don't isolate ourselves, even if we can't meet together in the same place. We stay in covenant with the community of faith, and it releases encouragement. David knew without God, he was nothing. So even when he messed up, he did not run away from God. He ran to God. He knew where his help was. And 1 Samuel 30, 18 says simply, David recovered it all. Everything the Amalekites had stolen, his family, all his stuff, 
and his joy. I couldn't imagine what our life would be like if, if someone stole Kaz from us. It would be like our heart was ripped out of our chest. There's three enemies of joy that makes this pandemic ball of kryptonite. Fear, anxiety, and worry. It's an unholy trinity. And it's kicking us. It's kicking us. God told the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 41, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Jesus said in Matthew 6, Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on it. It's not your life more than food and your body more than clothing. We must decide to move in faith and not fear. Fear will kill us. Faith will move us into life. When anxiety or worry shows up, go ahead and cast all of it on the Lord. That's, that's an active word to cast your anxieties, your fears on the Lord because he cares for you. When I have anxiety, I name it and I imagine it being on a baseball. I used to be a baseball player. Whether it's fear or worries about money or whatever it may be. And I just imagine that's in my hand. And I cast it away as far as I can. I throw it away. Fear, you're not staying here. Worry about money, you're not staying here. Sickness, you're, you're not staying here. And I, and I physically cast it away as hard as I can. Then I say, Lord, fill that place with joy. Fill that place with, work, with joy. We recover our superpower when we put our trust in Jesus, when we choose joy. Well, how, do you, how can you tell when joy, your superpower, goes missing? Let me just tell you what I do. It's been over for everybody. and um, I'm a little weird in my thought processes, but it works for me. The thing I do is I check my joy gauge. It's kind of like your fuel gauge in your car. When you see that gauge starting to go toward empty, you're going to have to refill that thing or you're going to be on the side of the road. Here's some indicators that you might need to ref refuel. You feel sad or anxious for no real good reason. You worry about things you have no control over. Now, wise counsel can help. Sometimes a visit to a physician is a wise thing to do to see if something physiologically is going on. But it helps to take a step back from your stress and your life and then ask for and wait on the Holy Spirit to restore your joy and restore your strength. And once you determine that you're, well, don't raise your hands or anything, but let me just ask you, how many of you just felt your joy tank is just sort of going toward empty in these last few weeks? I don't want to embarrass you, so don't raise your hands, but I imagine a number of you have just thought, I'm just not feeling it. I just don't have any energy. I, my want to doesn't want to. So then what you need to do is you need to refuel. Be honest that your joy tank is going down. And then refuel your joy tank by doing a couple of things. Number one, this sounds so silly, but it's so true. Rejoice till your want to wants to. <laughs> How do I do that? I just start reminding myself, sometimes out loud, of the good things God's done for me. Oh, God, thank you that you gave me a smoking hot wife. Oh, God, thank you that you gave me uh, a house to live in, a job that I love. Thank you for this friend and that friend. and Thank you for Kaz, my little joy bringer. And before I know it, my, 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 I rejoice until my want to wants to. And thankfulness starts to come back. It's a choice to rejoice. And then what I do is I start giving thanks till I become grateful. And often music is a big part of my life. And often these old songs will just come out of my hard drive and start playing in my head. 
I'll start singing an old Nadi's Don Moen song. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Come on. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. Now you can't sing that song and not rediscover your happy place. You can't really sing that song authentically and stay in that place without your joy. It starts to fill up your joy tank. The other thing I do is I ask the Holy Spirit to baptize me in joy before I go out into battle. There's a scripture in Romans 14 for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. It didn't say Holy Spirit, it said the Holy Ghost. It's more powerful for a Pentecostal to say Holy Ghost. <laughs> because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Now, when I read that scripture, another song starts playing in my head by an old guy named Ron Canoli that I met years ago. It's got a little choreography. Let me show you how it goes. You've got to do this with your fingers. Okay, we're going to sing it. When we come to that part, you're going to do this. Here's how it goes. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. Sing it again. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. Hey, don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? Don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? Don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? Come on, everybody. Now, let, let's put some sway into it, okay? Ready? Here we go. Righteousness, peace, move, joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. Big voice. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. Hey, don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? Hey, don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? Don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? Here we go. Come on, everybody. <laughs> oh, you did good. You did good. You did good. You did good. See, sometimes you got to do silly stuff. And you realize it's not silly stuff. It's the real stuff. So if you want joy in your life, you got to refill that tank. you got to refuel that tank. you got to remind yourself of songs and things you're thankful about. And you rejoice till you want to, wants to. Well, here's my take on how to win this tug of war between fear and joy. Number one, run into God's presence. David said in Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That word pleasures means joys. In your right hand are joys forevermore. There's good advice in the Bible. Read your Bible. Listen to what Paul said. Encourage each other. Today is the time to encourage each other to never be stubborn or hardened by sin's deceitfulness. It's in Hebrews 3. A simple word of encouragement could be that one thing that helps us hold on to our joy and defeat the kryptonite that is sucking the life right out of us. Solomon said in Proverbs 12, 25, anxiety weighs down the heart. But a kind word cheers it up. We need to quit thinking about ourselves and be kind enough to see people around us and give them a good word. Let's practice. Whoever's beside you, I want you to find something you can encourage them about. It may just be nice shirt, all right? But I want you to say, just real quickly, I want you to say something to the person beside you that encourages them. Hey, you got some guns, dude. Anything like that. <laughs> Hey, nice hair. <laughs> okay, come back, come back. Just come back, here we go. Someone said this, 
I think I said it. I think it's original. You know, sometimes I write a song and it sounds like something else and I, 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 I thrash around. Have you heard this song before? Have you heard this song before? When Paul McCartney wrote yesterday, it came in a dream. And he kept going to people for weeks saying, have you heard this melody? And finally he couldn't track it down. So he decided he had yesterday that came from a dream. Well, I heard this and I think it just popped up to my spirit. But you tell me if you've heard it from somewhere else. If hope and peace had a baby, it would be called joy. If hope and peace had a baby, they'd call it joy. Let the Holy Spirit fill you with hope. Let him satisfy you with peace. And the baby called joy will be birthed. This picture of a little girl in a camel will put a smile on your face. Can you put that up? Man, she was so contagious, she even got the camel to smiling there. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. We are filled with joy. Life happens sometimes in ways that can rob you of your joy, and I get that. And I'm not one of those guys that just uh, doesn't face reality. But there's another reality. There's another logic in heaven that's different than man's logic. And it comes and it overlays that human logic. Human logic would say it's hopeless. Be depressed. Heaven's logic would say put your hope in Jesus. Cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Rejoice till you want to, wants to. Now here's what I'd like to do. I have a few prophetic words I'm going to give in a few minutes, but life happens sometimes in ways that can rob you of your joy. I'd like to do a couple of things. One, I'd like to pray for anyone that's been struggling with a joy tank that was going down. I'm going to ask God to baptize you in joy. If that's you, you just need to admit it. You don't have to feel bad about it. That's part of the problem. You've been feeling bad about it. You just need to be honest. Lord, I can't find my joy. Will you give it back to me? All right? If that's you and you would love for me to pray for you to be baptized in joy, whether you're at Portage Campus or online, wherever you are here tonight, I'd like for you to just stand up wherever you are. And I'm going to pray when everybody stands. So you've just felt your joy tank getting a little depleted these last few months. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to ask God to baptize you in joy. Then I'm going to speak a blessing over you. Put your hand on your heart. Really focus in. This is between you and Jesus. It's not about anybody else. Lord Jesus, I just come tonight and I'm sitting right there with my joy tank depleting, running low. And you sent little Kaz down the stairs in his Captain America uniform and you sent him to bring me joy. And then that night when I prayed, you filled my heart with rejoicing. So Lord, I come right now in the name of Jesus and every saint that has stood up, everyone that stood up in this room, on the other campuses, there at home, I ask the Lord Jesus to baptize you in joy. Joy that comes from heaven and not from positive thoughts. Joy that comes from heaven, not as a reaction to something good just happened, but from the one who owns joy from the one that surrounds himself with joy, the one that only allows in his presence joy. So I come in Jesus' name, and I ask you to baptize people. Let it be as real as if they were being baptized in water. Lord, let it just start to bubble up. Let a rejoicing and a thankfulness and a gratefulness just bubble up in their spirits until they're full of joy and they've recovered the joy of the Lord as their strength. Now, Father, I want to bless them with this. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, 
you may abound in hope. I'm going to speak it over you again from Romans 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. In Jesus' name. Let's give the Lord a big hand clap and you have a seat. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, there's one other thing I want to mention. It's the joy of the Lord. It's not the joy that you just found some money you didn't know you had. It's not the joy of someone giving you a break and paying for your uh, Starbucks. It's the joy of the Lord. It's his. Now, the only legitimate way that you cannot know the joy of the Lord is if you don't know the Lord. So I want to give an opportunity here at the other campuses, sitting there at home. If you're honest, you've really not made Jesus the Lord of your life. Romans tells us, if you'll believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, if you'll confess with your heart that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There is a joy in salvation. And that's when real joy starts to come into you. So if you're here tonight and being honest, you just said, I've got to get a hold of this. I've got to give my life to Jesus once and for all. Whether you're on another campus, whether you're at home watching online, or whether you're in here tonight, once again, I want to ask you to just stand up wherever you are. And whenever everyone stands up that wants to, I'm going to pray a prayer and lead you in a prayer. And you're going to become a child of God. You're going to know the joy of salvation and the joy of the Lord is going to be available to you. If that's you, would you stand up right now and I'll pray when those stand up that wants to go ahead and do that right now. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Come on. Here's your chance. Other campuses, go ahead and stand up. Don't don't even care what other people think. This is about what Jesus thinks about you. Anyone else want to stand up? All right, if you're standing, those of you that are standing, would you just put your hand on your heart? And would you pray out loud? Thank you. Would you pray out loud with me these words? Pray out loud. Lord Jesus, I need joy. I don't have it. I ask you to come into my heart. And save me. I repent of my sins tonight. And I invite you. To come and be my savior. And my Lord. Thank you Jesus. For saving me. By your grace. I will follow you. All the days of my life. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. God bless you brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love being with your church. I prayed for you a week before I came and felt like the Lord gave me a word. And this is for the whole Radiant Church family here and on the other campuses, those of you at home. And I'm just going to read this word out and then I will, I will give it to Pastor Lee to keep. While reading in Romans, I heard in my spirit, read Romans 12, 21 over Radiant Church. Here's what that says. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. As I pressed in to understand, I saw this church being given a grace to move another way than those who are choosing the broad path of the world. Radiant Church will move in an opposite spirit of the many prevailing winds blowing across the world currently. As you take lifestyle steps to faith, you will discover a new freedom to walk a straight and narrow path. Your walk will reflect God's kingdom values and attitudes, actions, and affections. This walk will not be an outward religious show. It will be from an honest overflow from transformed hearts. So when you face greed, be generous. Where you confront fear, do so in faith with the power, love, and sound mind that you've been given. Where you see anger and hate, show love and kindness. 
Where you see unforgiveness, forgive and show mercy. Where despair or depression surfaces, put on a garment of praise. And remember these three things. The joy of the Lord is your strength. In God's presence is fullness of joy. And joy is your superpower. Two keys to moving in the opposite spirit. Number one, remember for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And this is very important. I felt like the Lord spoke this to me. Don't respond to how you feel. Respond to who you know. Should be a song in there somewhere. Going forward, I'm seeing a timely Bible passage being worked into you in this season from Psalm 30, 10, and 11. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will play, praise you forever. And listen at it from the message translation. You did it. You changed wild lament into whirling dance. You ripped off my black mourning band and decked me with wildflowers. I'm about to burst with song. I can't keep quiet about you. God, my God, I can't thank you enough. God is doing something remarkable in your hearts in this Selah moment that you've been in. You're being given an opportunity through your attitudes, actions, and affections to make Jesus attractive and intelligible among you and beyond you going forward. I proclaim over you, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good, and the joy of the Lord is your superpower. Amen. Let me give this word over Pastor Lee and, and Miss Jane. Could y'all stand up? I love these two. As I were praying for you two, I kept being distracted by the Paul Balash song, Open the Eyes of My Heart. It just would not stop playing in my head. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, you remember? Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you. I want to see you. I love that old song, but I kept trying to push it out of my head. I was pressing in, asking the Lord, do you have anything for Lee and Jane? And I heard, this song is for them. I'm sending it in a fresh and timely way for them to steward. As I sat with that, I realized the Holy Spirit was showing me something for you two together going into 2021. This will be a year that you experience an elevation in revelation. I see the Holy Spirit visiting you in dreams, visions, and revealing wonderful things you don't know through words of knowledge, revelation in the scripture, and inspired lyrics for songs. You'll lead the way to reestablish the family altar from house to house. God's going to use you to do that. The song goes to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing, holy, holy, holy. This will be a year of combining honest prayer with authentic worship. As you give yourselves to inviting his presence, a sound will go up from here that will disarm strongholds vying for space in your hearts, your church, and in your city. It will be a sound of transformation. I began to read and pray Ephesians 1, 18 and 19 over you. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparable great power for us who believe. I heard you speaking these verses over those the Lord is attracting to himself and the sound began to grow in volume. And I saw power and love being poured out. No hype, no manipulation, no marketing strategy. Just Jesus opening the eyes of hearts who were beating in rhythm with heaven. And the sound of holy, holy, holy will rise from this house. And you will know increased times of angelic visitation. People will hear this sound. They'll come to seek his face in this place. And so the sound of this house will be multiplied here, there, and everywhere that the Lord opens your eyes to see. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I want to give a couple of words to understand a couple of men that are on the Portage campus. So if you're there in Portage, you didn't escape, as Pastor Lee said. This is for Toby. 
got to meet him today, or maybe I'd met him before, but he was leading the group of students that I spoke to. And I heard this for you, Toby, this afternoon. I know you have a heart for China. You told me that. But you need to know that China has a tender heart for you. The Holy Spirit has led others to tend and water the seeds you have been given, that you have been faithful to plant there. A door will open this year in 2021 for you to go in time to see the ripe harvest that is coming forth. You'll go at a time to fulfill Amos 9, 13 through 14. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills, and I will bring my people Israel back from exile. Toby, be patient. Do the work of an evangelist who equips evangelists. This exile will come to an end and a door of effective service will open and you'll go in the power of the Holy Spirit to a harvest field ready to reap. Amen. And this is for Rick uh, Burmeister. I know that your role is at Radiant Church. I was told that today, so I know that about you. But I see that your investments made here will be among the best returns you'll ever receive. You have an entrepreneur's view through an apostolic lens of getting the foundation strengthened. Another move of the Holy Spirit is coming to this church and this city. God has sent you to lay solid infrastructure that will allow building on top of a strong foundation. An anointing to receive and restore prodigals is rising even within your own house as it will be in God's house. Look again at the story of the prodigal's father and make it your aim to be like him. You're a good man. You're a gift to this church. Be encouraged. Thank you, Lord. Amen. I'm going to ask Pastor Lee to join me and we're going to come down and walk around and give words in season. Now, some of these words may, uh, may find that they are in another campus because I got some words of knowledge that had to do with uh, what people was wearing. That's been happening for the last couple of months. All right? The man with a dark blue-gray hoodie. I saw that he was on the third row on the right side. That'd be you. What's your name? Travis. You stand up, Travis. You struggled to come tonight, but the Holy Spirit drew you here to tell you something. It's better than it seems. Your setback was actually a setup for the Lord to get you to be open to the new he has for you. I see a fresh season of all things, all things becoming new in your life. Let go of the old branches the Lord has pruned. The branches left will be the strong ones that you need. A phone call in March, an open door in April, a new field of grace to walk in by May. Things are much better than they seem. Be encouraged. Nope. Here, while, while he's doing that, it's rough when Wayne Drain wants you to do prophetic ministry with him. But uh, it's an honor. Uh, this young lady right here. Yeah, you. Would you stand up? What's your name? Mackenzie. Mackenzie. I don't think I know you. Uh, but So I'm saying that because I'm the pastor and I never want to take advantage of people that I know. So I felt like the Lord during worship spoke over me that your worship comes up before him as a sweet-smelling aroma. And he wants you to know that uh, there's been a season in your life where you felt like you were overlooked. But God has never overlooked you that he's always seen you. He's seen you in the public and he's seen you in the private. And that there, you're entering into a season uh, and into a time period of your life where there's gonna be a public reward of some sort. I don't know what that is, but God, it's actually God. God's gonna promote you and he's gonna bring about a reward and it's gonna be a gift to highlight all of the years or all of the times where you felt others were shining and others were recognized and others were out in front. God says, because you were willing to take the back, I'm pulling you to the front, and there's a reward that's coming in the next season for you. So God bless you, Mackenzie.
This afternoon uh, in my room back at the hotel, uh, the Lord showed me what some people were wearing, and then I was relieved and delighted when I came in the night and saw them. It's great. I saw a guy in a gray flannel shirt, and that would be you. What's your name? Evan, would you stand up? Evan, you weren't made to blend into the background or called to go along to get along. You were made to stand out from the crowd in order to stand up as a disciple of Jesus. The Lord is giving you attention so you can draw attention to him. As your zeal for the Lord grows, his favor increases. Your calling is to show and tell of God's goodness, his kindness, as you tell your story, your wins and your failures, your strengths and your weaknesses. You're gonna be a heralder of the good news of God's kingdom. Don't be afraid. Don't doubt yourself. Use what he's put in your hands, whatever gifts you've had. Trust Jesus. He will always give you what you need. Right there, stand up. Help me with your name. Ethan. Ethan. I heard the Lord say, uh, do not despise the days of small beginnings, Ethan. That there's something that's in your heart, it's a dream, it's an idea. It's kind of a, a forecast of where God's taking you. I think you have a really strong sense of purpose in the things that you're gonna do later on in your life. Uh, there's a tendency to try and get too far ahead of yourself. And the Lord says, do not despise the moment yet that you're in or the smallness of that dream. Protect the dream, submit the dream, and be faithful to the process. And God has his hand on your life. God bless you, Ethan. Yeah. There was a, uh, another one I saw in the hotel room was a girl with a yellow top, and that would be you. Would you stand up? Tell me your name. Melody. Melody. Great name. You have been through many ups and downs, through dangers, toils, and snares you've already come. But you're an overcomer who has exchanged a prison of anxiety for becoming a prisoner of hope. I hear Psalm 119, 114 for you. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices my flesh and also will rest in hope. Hope is a confident expectation of what God has promised, and its strength is in His faithfulness, not yours. I see a gift of faith rising up alongside a gift of hope. You will encourage many to exchange their current prisons to become set free prisoners of hope. So you will know this is true. Someone will tell you they feel hopeful after they talk to you. What camera? Okay, so this, this word is for Portage. This is over at Portage. And so center section, four rows back on the center aisle. So let's see, if I'm looking out, it's to my left, center section, four rows back, somebody in that section. Uh, the word of the Lord is this, that it's a, it's a gentleman it's a, a man, and the Lord says that this is a season where God is cutting things away that actually hinder you and limit you from being in, being in a position for what God wants to direct you into the next season. There's some things that right now feel like pain because they're being removed and they're being taken away, and God says, surrender them. Those are weights and hindrances that are holding you back from running the race that God has for you. So get ready, you've only just begun. So receive that word, whoever you are, and if there's nobody sitting in that seat, just pass it on down to the next person. There you go. Uh, the, other, the other word I got in the hotel was a guy with a USA or America shirt. And I met him earlier. Are you still in here, the USA Landon. shirt? There you go. What's your name? Nathan? Landon. You've been told of your potential and that you have hope and a future all your life. Those words have seemed to be words of hope deferred and even disappointing at times. But listen, those words are true. In this place, among these people at this time, you will move beyond a realized potential 
The Holy Spirit will empower spiritual gifts within you. You will prophesy and you will preach. Prophecy and evangelism will team up in you as they did in Philip the Evangelist in Acts 8. Two things to learn from Philip's example. He learned to serve by waiting tables as a deacon. Then he learned to hear God's voice and act in obedience. Let Philip become a model for you. Hope will rise and faith will explode in you. And your character will run aside your gift as evidence of the Lord's hand on your life. There's a lady right here with dark hair and white top sitting on the front row. Would you stand up, please? Tracy. Tracy, you're sort of the object of my message tonight, I think, when I saw this. I looked over at you during worship, and I saw explosions of joy inside you. They were bursting out beyond you. You were infecting people with a spirit of joy, like a joy virus. I saw people rediscovering their smiles as joy strengthened them. You are called to be an encourager, a woman who carries a yes in her heart for whatever Jesus asks. It's a joy to serve. It's a joy to praise Him. It's a joy to be free of pain. And you have known pain. You made a good move the day you made the choice to rejoice. Now you're called to be a joy bringer. You will prophesy encouragement, edifying words of comfort. That's your portion. Amen. Thank you. Is there someone in here named Griffin that's sitting on the front row maybe? Oh, he's here. He's, I met Griffin just back in the, in the office before we came out. Griffin, I just heard this when I glanced over at you during worship. You are a good fit in this family. You will lead the sons to honor the fathers in this house. And so you will know the blessings of the fathers. You have been a man of honor, a good son. And so you will be a good father who blesses many sons and daughters without, who don't have connection to earthly fathers. And you'll know the joy of reconciling prodigal fathers with prodigal sons and daughters. You are a good fit in this house, in this family. Just be thankful. Let God use you to help set the lonely into God's family. You're a man of the word, a man of the spirit, and a man of high character. I come to affirm you tonight. Be at peace. You found a good fit. Amen. Amen. I have one more word, and it's for Anna Asbury. Would you stand up, Anna? I know you, obviously. The Lord showed me a picture uh, of you, and it was you, and I know you're an artist. So it was you standing in front of your easel, and the Lord had your paintbrushes in his hands, and he was soaking them in a jar and cleaning them out. And the Lord said, you've wondered why nothing new has come, and the Lord says he's changing the paint on your palette and that you're in a season right now where the brushes are in the water. He's rinsing out the brushes and it feels like you've lost everything, that there's no more color on your brush. But the Lord says, I'm only cleaning it because I'm putting new paint on your palette and you're gonna paint brand new pictures and there's a brand new season coming and it's gonna be brighter pictures, brighter colors. So hold steadfast, the master artist has your brushes and your heart in his hand. God bless you. Amen. Does the, uh, does the number 52 mean anything personally to anyone that's in this room tonight or at Portage? The number 52. If that's you, would you stand up? The number 52. Thank you, Lord. What does that number 52 mean to you? That's my, that's my level where I'm at in my company. That's, that's the level. And I reached that when I turned 52. Wow, did you hear that? So my, I was promoted to level 52 in my company at 52, which my wife fasted for. And well, I heard the Lord say double that, double that. I see increase, and I see increase in influence, increase in provision. You are a good steward. God can trust you with finances. 
So he's going to increase what you have. And he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna move heaven's resources from here to there. And he's going to use you. Uh, you love the poor. You're not intimidated by the wealthy. You're just a giving, generous man. And I come to affirm you tonight. In 52 days, something big is going to happen in your life. Amen. 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 Wasn't that good? Has anybody got some joy this morning or this evening? It's almost morning. Let's all stand up together. And can we just put our hands together and thank Wayne Drain. Thank you so much for coming. So, Wayne, let me tell you something about that song, Open the Eyes of My Heart. So when Jane and I planted Radiant, the, one of the first guests that we ever had was Paul Balash. He came when we were uh, less than a year old. We were meeting in the school cafeteria, and he said to me when we were in the car, I just wrote this new song. I've only played it at my home church, but I rewrote the chorus to it, and I'm gonna sing it in your church for the first time, and it was Open the Eyes of My Heart. So... That, that song has a special place in our hearts. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Lord, we love you. Thank you for a powerful, beautiful, joy-filled evening. Thank you, Lord, that you rejoice over us. You dance over us. You sing over us with joy and songs of deliverance. Lord, we love you. We love being in your presence. We love seeking your face. We love to hear your voice. And we welcome you. And we leave this place tonight, not leaving your presence, but as carriers of your presence. Lord, we love you. We look forward to seeking you early in the morning, at noon and at night, tomorrow and every day, as we continue to seek you with prayer and fasting. Send us from this place full of joy, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, everybody.